and thank you for joining Infotax for this movie presentation. As you may know, this is a recording of a previous webinar recorded by Infotax as part of our awareness training series. To access all of the Infotax published webinar movies, visit tour.infotax.com, where you can also find a schedule of our upcoming webinars about IT governance and cybersecurity. Please know that at the end of this presentation are several legal disclaimers. These disclaimers explain the links shown on your screen. This movie, titled Simple As It Seems, is based on a webinar recorded in December 2018. In response to many requests for a presentation centered around what school corporations should be looking for in a seam, the movie refers to a grant made by the Indiana Department of Education, which may or may not still be in play by the time you watch this movie. And now, it is our pleasure to introduce to you our webinar moderator, the code curator and special envoy from the seam, Michael Hartke. Hello, everybody. That intro still gets me. My name is Michael Harkey. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Today's webinar is called As Simple As It Seems, Technology Risk Monitoring for Schools. Now I see there are a few banking clients in the audience and I want you to know you are as welcome to this talk as any school corporation, of course. For those of you who are new to Infotex, we have been a preferred service provider for banks since 2003 and we are used to a lot of banks joining our webinars. So banks, the good news is that a seam is a seam is a seam. But please know, instead of the compliance aspects of this webinar being organized around the GLBA like you are accustomed to, we are focusing this webinar on what school corporate corporations need, meaning that the governing framework are the regulations surrounding FERPA, which stands for the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act of 1974. What? Yes, that's right, 1974. Suffice it to say, the laws governing student privacy have been around for a while, and there is a fresh new interpretation, especially surrounding the function we call incident response. So, if you do work in a bank, the first three-fourths of this webinar will be very interesting. But when we get to the end and Dan starts talking about how a seam can help with FERPA compliance, let's just say we won't be offended if you drop off. And now, I'd like to introduce to you our speaker, the man with 13 letters after his name, the tamer of spreadsheets, the breaker of tech, and a man with a plan, Dan Hathaway. Dan? Thank you, Michael. Nice introduction, by the way. Wow. First, I would like to welcome our schools to this webinar. Thank you for joining us. And then, to you regulars, uh, we definitely appreciate your continued patronage. Thank you very much for you know, joining us month after month in our webinars. Second, since this webinar has so many school corporations in the audience, they might not realize that we, our, our company Infotex, is a managed security service provider. We provide our own proprietary SIEM and we manage it for our clients 24 by 7. Third, let me acknowledge the many different names for the processes that we are going to be teaching you about today. While Infotex calls what we sell a SIEM, and while we want that to mean a security information and event management system, there are many competing visions for what incident response teams need, and at you know, many levels of maturity right now. And so while we might all hopefully agree that it is a very important security control, we definitely haven't even agreed upon what it is. I mean, what, what is that control? And heck, I mean, if you think about it, now not everybody even calls it a scene, right? I mean, way back in 2005, we called it Logmon. I really, have, I, I sometimes joke about the fact that that's because our programmers spent that spring in Jamaica. Uh, but we've heard our clients refer to it as everything from a SIM to a SEM to a SIM. Uh, one of my clients is now calling an SIEM. And so in the spirit of joviality, I've 
kind of taken to calling it the control with many names. And, you know, I guess the bottom line is, is that your takeaway from this should be that not every provider seem uh, has the same definition as the one we're going to reveal to you in this webinar. And so what we mean when we say seem is that it's a place that helps information security professionals manage their incident response process. And it's where they go for information about governance strategy and tactical plans and risk mitigation and that sort of thing, as well as it being a place for the team to assemble to perform the most fundamental yet scary task of IT governance, which is to respond to a scary incident on our network or on our users or even on our parents or our students. And so this high-level definition that we have kind of created for our own SIEM centers around the compliance and security needs of smaller community-based banks and credit unions and schools and healthcare organizations. And so our definition arises from the notion that at least with schools and, and, and credit unions, et cetera, if you're doing a good job, incident response is 90% preparation about 8% follow-up and about 2% actual response. Now, if you're doing a bad job, it doesn't, you know, look like that. It looks like, you know, about 90% actual response and 8% quitting your job, quite frankly, because the number one thing that leads to us quitting our job, whether we get fired or not, is the shame we feel when we've done a bad job of responding to incidents. So, which really kind of leads to my introducing the notion that we've really been doing this for a long time here at Infotex. And while we didn't land our first school corporation client until 2003, we started watching networks back in 2000. And in the early days, you know, we didn't even look at event logs. We just put sensors on Novell and Windows NT networks and then using Snort, which was a network traffic analysis engine, uh, we would watch the traffic in the network. And really, it was then that we saw a need for an open source clearinghouse where people could not only download signatures, but also develop and help us develop signatures for Snort. And so we founded BleedingSnort.com, uh, which eventually evolved into BleedingEdge.com, which I still have the logo for that. I don't think we even had a logo for BleedingSnort.com. And then BleedingEdge.com eventually evolved into EmergingThreats.net, which went, you know, commercial and became a company that was sold for $40 million a few years ago to Proofpoint. So that's really kind of the history of at least threat intelligence and, and kind of the history of, you know, a, a seam at extremely bird's eye view. Um, let's kind of dive in a little more into the details of how seams have evolved over the years. And so in the early days, those concerned with information security started out with an intrusion detection system. And if you hear me say IDS, that's what I'm talking about, intrusion detection. And IDS systems listened in on network traffic using Snort. And really, we quickly ended up adding IPS to the equation when we realized, hey, you know, about 30% of these signatures are for predictable events. We might as well just block them from happening in the first place. And I'll explain more about IPS versus IDS, IPS being a preventive control, um, later in this webinar. But then we also added change detection to the picture. Um, and really, this is where we would scan for, find a report on changes in critical assets like, you know, your customer list or what we ended up, you know, everybody settled on was their firewall. And so, you know, change detection on your firewall is kind of a default service now. Um, but we can do change detection on any critical asset in your network. But by 2005, we started realizing that traffic analysis alone was not going to do the job. And we needed context, you know, what we now call forensics history. And the best way to document the context was with event logs coming from servers and other critical devices. So, 
you know, of course, we didn't have big data tactics back then, and so we had to be very careful about the amount of data we were bringing into a database, but that's really what started happening in 2005. Uh, we started running event logs into our database, and, you know, once we were able to start applying big data tactics, uh, we started putting everything into that database, and we had the beginnings of our seam. Um, and as I explained before, I mean, this is kind of a seam, but it's not really a seam. And I'm going to explain a lot more about that when we get to defining what a seam is. But please know that moving forward, there are three factors that will be completing the evolution of the seam. And they'll be taking place very quickly, which is why I call it an evolution in revolution. Uh, but those three factors are machine learning, uh, which, you know, the bad guys are deploying artificial intelligence and machine learning, and, and we're realizing we need to as well. We're really looking forward to those benefits that are going to come from machine learning. Uh, but then also the bad guys are encrypting their attacks, so we need some method of, you know, decrypting packets and inspecting them, and we call that SSL inspection. And then finally, where, you know, Infotex is taking their seam is we want it to be a place um, where we can establish and train the incident response team. So today we'll be drilling down into why you should consider a seam, and then we'll define what a seam actually is, and, and then we'll show you a seam in action, and finally we'll be talking about how all this applies to schools and how a seam can not only protect your parents and teachers, but also put you in compliance with the myriad of laws you face related to information security. And by the way, they're not just, you know, FERPA. Um, for our existing clients and those of you who have your own SIEM or your own MSSP already, uh, please know that we have published a movie on how to test your SIEM on our website um, with all the money that our clients are spending to allow us to manage their SIEM. They need to be testing on a regular basis to make sure that all the moving parts are aligned so that the seam is performing as expected. So, let's get started with our webinar. What we have here is a failure to drill down into the details. So, why do we need a seam? This diagram is a popular illustration of what I would call the anatomy of an attack if cybersecurity kill chain wasn't such a cool term, right? And it shows us how a breach progresses and what we can do to defend ourselves in each link of the chain. And I don't know if you're noticing the word seam in there, but it's going to help you thwart delivery and take actions in step seven of the kill chain and all that sort of thing. And, and you know, I just want you to realize that if that's the reason why you're deploying a seam, great. But we can thwart attacks using other tools as well. So... While a seam really helps with it, and it takes its place in the cyber kill chain, and it might provide those of us who already have a seam with a sense of relief that it, you know, fits right into the cyber kill chain, um, it does not really fully represent why you would want to have a seam, in our opinion. Um, not with the amount of work it takes to deploy and maintain and, and, and keep a seam healthy. So please know that Infotex comes at this from a different angle, because we do not use the anatomy of an attack to justify a seam. The cybersecurity kill chain simply ignores a major part of the reason why we want to deploy a seam, right? I mean, it ignores the I in the acronym seam. It's not just about event management. It's also about being armed. I mean, this is the 21st century. We're, we're in the information age. And so we need to be armed with information. And, and really what we mean, if we want to drill down on that, is we need to be armed with preparation. Not to mention, cyber kill this and cyber kill that, and guess what? It becomes too geeky, too technical. I'm not using geek as a bad word here, but we're going to lose the very people who we need to teach and who we need to motivate, who's probably wondering why they need to be on the incident response team anyway, and that's the non-technical management team members who we need to be involved in the decision-making process that arises out of an attack. So instead, at Infotex, we would rather approach defining why we need a seam from a risk management perspective. 
and we can reduce risk management to a three-step process that starts by measuring risk. When we say measuring risk, really what we're talking about is brainstorming the assets that are at risk and then determining which vulnerabilities represent the most risk and then which controls mitigate the most risk. Um, those of you who are in our webinar audience who you know, know me well know I've written a, a song called The Risk Assessment that, that just kind of walks through what needs to happen when you measure risk. But then, based on residual risk, we should determine how we're going to respond to risk. Do we transfer risk by outsourcing or, or acquiring insurance? Do we mitigate risk by installing new controls? Or do we accept the risk? And then by the way, if we decide we're going to mitigate the risk, we're, we're still accepting the risk before we mitigate it, right? And so in either case, we need to monitor the risk. We need to monitor the vendors if we're going to outsource to our vendors. We need to monitor, you know, risk mitigation. Are we, uh, are we implementing our best laid plans? And then finally, you know, we should really be making sure that the controls we think are mitigating risk already are working. And so risk monitoring is a very, very important part of risk management. And it really is what ensures that we're not working off a false sense of security. Now, while unfortunately many organizations are forced to look into a seam for compliance reasons, this should not be the reason why you go through all the time and effort and money to deploy a seam. Instead, we should seize on its value in helping us with risk mitigation, ensuring the controls are working and you know improving the team's confidence and that sort of thing. And of course, we want an early response to cyber threats, which is the event management part right, of a seam. Um, and boy, the fact that a seam's trend analysis tools give us the ability to do what we call threat hunting is definitely an added value. It's a definite good reason why we would want to have a seam. But keep in mind, threat hunting and, and all this takes time. And it's really why, you know, we might want to consider outsourcing seam management to an MSSP or managed security service provider. But another way to justify a seam is to think about what happens when we don't monitor for risk. Ultimately, unmonitored risk leads to this little equation down here, right? Unauthorized access. But there's a lot of bad things that happen on the way to that as well. If you want to have the ability to look for threats exploiting vulnerabilities, then you need to set up some kind of method for monitoring technology risk, and a seam really lends itself to that because it you know, puts us in a position where We've got all the tools in place that are necessary to monitor for threats exploiting vulnerabilities. A properly designed seam also prioritizes what we see. Um, we, you know, we can, you know, basically count on a seam to help fight the noise. It's, it's a slogan we use at Infotex, fight the noise with our seam. But we still want to get information from everywhere. And there's kind of a, a push and pull there because, you know, it also costs more money to get information for everywhere. So what usually happens is we go through a process, a risk assessment process, to determine what we're going to monitor and to layer a risk mitigating paper trail for what we decide not to monitor. And then most importantly, and I know I'm an auditor, by the way, I'm an IT auditor, those 13 letters after my name that, you know, Michael talked about in the introduction are all centered around audits. And uh, so, you know, keep that in mind when I say this, but to me as an auditor, the most important function of a seam is that it gives us the ability to monitor the overall health of our security systems. It's, it, it, it becomes, a seam becomes like the watcher watching the watchers and that's a very very important component of a good scene the incident response process actually requires three different teams working together as one team so you know these three teams comprise what we call the risk monitoring team 
there's an internal tech team that could very well be the company that you've outsourced all your network support to if you're a small organization, but it's usually the IT staff at the school corporation. But when we say internal tech team, we're really talking about the people with the screwdrivers, right? The people that have the ability to fix the systems. They're the ones that are setting up new users. They have the administrator credentials to be able to change the network or, you know, open ports and firewalls, etc. And so while they may watch the network very carefully and really consider their, you know, information security to be part of their responsibility, they can change the network and thus from a security perspective, we do not want to rely on them to be the watchers. I mean, they're making enough, you know, uh, or they're, they're spending enough time uh, handling what they already have to handle. It's essential that the second team, the incident response team, be multidisciplinary, meaning that it includes members that are from surprising areas, ranging from faculty and students to maybe even parents or, or a board member. The incident response team should not consist only of people from the school's IT department. The team needs people who can talk to your faculty and your students. It needs the person who acquires the cybersecurity insurance. It, it needs the person who counsels the troubled employee or the person who speaks to parents or customers or, you know, the press, ultimately, the media. But the incident response team is not only involved in the notification process. The team also, you know, is involved in preparation and monitoring for risk. The incident response team plays a critical role in risk monitoring because the non-technical risks that we can't discover in network traffic or event logs is really where a huge amount of the breaches are coming from. Given that over 70% of the breaches still arise from policy violations or untrained users, the non-technical roles of an incident response team when it comes to monitoring for policy and procedure enforcement, those roles are critical. And then finally, there's the third team over here, the MSSP or Managed Security Service Provider. It's what Infotex is. Um, it's denoted by the acronym MSSP. Um, if you're a huge organization that's building your own team, you might call it a Security Operations Center or, or SOC. And, and just so you know, an MSSP has a SOC. Um, the MSSP usually manages the primary inputs to the SIEM, the, the IPS, the IDS, the ELM, you know, the change detection inputs. But the MSSP is also involved in incident response, and, and they're going to be able to tell us what happened in a manner where we know that they didn't affect what happened. Now, when Infotex defines a seam, we talk about it being a place. And we believe the entire incident response process, from the incident log to the incident you know, response team, um, should be served by the seam. And, and the seam should be really a place where those four inputs, the traditional seem, you know, um, is, is the, the, the reports from those inputs are made available in a repository or maybe a wiki or something. This seam needs to be a place that not only serves the emergency meetings that we hold when there is an incident, you know what I mean, and, and maybe we, we have a drill down log or, you know, a, a log of all of our incidents and then when we get into a panic, there's a wizard driven log that helps walk us through the incident response process and, and that we can link out to the various tools we have at our disposal such as talking point memos and, and response, you know, notification letters and, uh, you know, forensics checklists and that sort of thing. Um, but then also it's a place where we come together in preparation for an incident um, via usually a monthly incident response team meeting. Um, where we train on the tools that we have available, uh, where maybe we review and close out prior incidents and that sort of thing. And then finally, the SEAM can serve as the wiki for all those response tools, etc. Um, and it needs to integrate with the ticketing system uh, 
so that mitigation of issues as they arise can be tracked. So these three teams are working together as one team and they need to seem to coordinate the training and preparation that goes into responding to an incident. And so I'd just like to walk you through a typical incident response process, really it's defined by NIST, um, that starts with, you know, detecting, hey, something's going on. And then based on that detection, we respond to the incident, and that might include a whole set of processes surrounding the notion of do we need to notify our parents and students. Um, and then we have a postmortem review after an incident so that we can train our team and improve our plan and do a better job the next time, right? And and it's a cyclical process, so you know it it it, it you know incident response starts with training and it ends with training is what we always say. And and this should be organized around the seam. The seam should be a place that facilitates all four of these processes. However, most seams are centered around detection and response currently. And that's because of the history of theme we already talked about where, you know, we, we started off with IPS, IDS, ELM and change detection. Uh, but suffice it to say, most seam providers are moving towards this architecture, so to speak. Um, and they're, you know, still struggling on trying to get the seam to also address training and notification. Another important primary function of a seam is what we call thresholding and normalization um, and parsing as well. A good seam will turn data from, you know, all these inputs that, quite frankly, it starts off rather cryptic in raw fashion and, and a seam turns it into meaningful information. And while our data security analysts have been trained to decipher all that cryptic information, all these alerts and, you know, everything that comes from these inputs, the incident response team is supposed to be staffed by non-technical people as well who are definitely going to be intimidated by the raw format, you know, from, you know, alerts coming off of a snort system or a Siricata system, by the way. We don't use snort anyway. It's been upgraded to Siricata, uh, which is a new, it's the next generation um, traffic analyzer and the bottom line is is that you know we need to make this data information and so thresholding comes into play when the decision tree you know asks for us to be notified when a hard drive hits 80 percent of capacity as an example we don't want the hundreds of logs that you know keep occurring every time you know the hard drive you know notices that it's at 80 percent of capacity that would drive us nuts we just want one notice in real time maybe and then a daily reminder after that until we fix the issue and so you know even the most technical people are are having a hard time reading obscure event logs without using google and so because of that the seam really provides a lot of value in turning data into information and it's not just Infotex, by the way, that, that's working towards all of this. You know, soon all of the major SIEM providers will be there. They'll, 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 the SIEM will be a place, or at least how they define it. Um, and so I wanted to show you, you know, that there's a lot of players in the market. Uh, Infotex is a small company, so you're not going to see us on a, a, a Gartner Magic Quadrant uh, you know, diagram. But I wanted to show you the other players that are out there. And what I want you to also know is that these are the people who develop seams, right? They develop applications, the database we've been talking about. But managed security service providers may or may not use a seam that's been developed by somebody else. Um, Infotex is using our own seam, but there are managed security service providers that are using seams that are developed by one of those companies that are in the management magic quadrant. What we want to make sure you realize is that if you're going to outsource the development of your seam, and most school corporations really should stay away from, you know, building their own socks. So most school corporations are going to choose a managed security service provider to manage their seam for them. And if that's the case, we just want to make sure you true you choose a true 
MSSP. You, and, and, and our definition of a true MSSP is that they have these quality controls in place. They employ enough certified data security analysts to fill 21 shifts a week because we need them to watch networks 24 by 7 by 365 and we don't want them doing anything else but watching networks. They can provide summaries of their own audit reports. I don't know why we don't have a line leading to this, but this is the one that's often the hardest to get. Um, they should be able to tell you which commercial threat intelligence feed they use as their primary intelligence feed. Um, Infotex, by the way, uses Emerging Threats Pro. Uh, we helped found a company that evolved into Emerging Threats Pro, so we have a really good deal on signatures. But the MSSP has plenty of insurance, and it's not really centered on breach notification. It's centered on breach liability. Your school insurance is centered on having to notify the costs of notifying all of your parents and students. Your MSSP's insurance should be centered on the liability they would have if they didn't stop a threat exploiting a vulnerability in your school. It's a different type of cybersecurity insurance. And then we're talking about these, these data security analysts we're talking about making sure that they truly are doing nothing but watching your network all day long or all shift long. And we want to make sure that the reports coming from your MSSP are providing meaning, which really means that your MSSP has been working with schools long enough to know what schools need. And then finally, we'll talk about this when we get to the FERPA um, aspects of you know outsourcing the development of your seam but your MSSP needs to be able to demonstrate that they're in compliance with all the applicable laws which in your case are three different laws and so if you find that all these quality controls are in place with you know the the vendor that you're looking into building your and managing your seam for you then you have what Infotex would call a true managed security service provider one of the most important benefits of outsourcing the monitoring of your network really kind of goes back to what I was talking about before, that segregation of duties issue. The people who are changing your network, the, the internal technical team, need to be in a position where when that internal breach occurs, and keep in mind, 70% of breaches are still internal. And it's been that way since the CSI FBI report was first produced in about 2002. But when there is an internal breach, the internal technical team must be able to point to the watchers and say, hey, it wasn't me, ask the watchers. And the watchers must not be allowed to change the system so that in an internal breach, we can count on the fact that they didn't change anything. They didn't forge the evidence, so to speak. And so we cannot have the fox watching the hen house, right? And this is for the benefit of the foxes as well as the chickens. Segregation of duties is an issue that foolish, ignore, or, you know, foolish organizations are ignoring. And it's going to end up becoming more and more expensive to address the more and more entrenched they get in blending the people who are supposed to be watching the system with the people who are supposed to be changing the system. And so if you're building your own knock, segregation is eventually going to sneak up to haunt you if you don't address it early. And the bottom line is you can't have network engineer staff your sock because then you miss out on the, segreg the segregation prerogatives of a scene. I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, so let me just summarize by saying that when you outsource the seam to a managed security service provider, you're solving a lot of issues, including segregation. And if you're building your own SOC, you just need to make sure that your DSAs do not have administrator rights. 
Which brings me to defining what a seam actually really is. So, what is a seam anyway? We have been talking today already about a seam as a database. It's how we actually started our development of the seam back in 2005 when we started putting event logs and eventually everything else into the database. And then we watched that database. It was the proverbial put all your eggs in one basket and then watch the basket. But because of economic reasons, Nowadays, most organizations are managing the size of that database by limiting the inputs into the seam. And so there's pretty much four primary inputs that a, a seam is currently accepting. There's going to be more as the speed of, you know, you know, systems improves and as big data tactics improve as machine learning improves we'll be able to put more into the system but right now you know there's four different inputs and the first one is intrusion prevention like we already talked about intrusion prevention is a preventive control about 30 percent of the known bad things that can happen on your network can be predicted and blocked using signature technologies but IPS is the system that requires a sensor to be another point of failure in your network is what we need to realize. And because IPS requires that a sensor be in a position where it can block traffic that it considers to be negative, we have introduced a single point of failure into the process. And so we call this inline, by the way, when the IPS sensor is in between the, the, you know, it's in the network traffic. It's in between the firewall and the switch, usually, or it might be between the internet and the firewall. And we can mitigate the availability risk by having the IPS sensor fail open. But the problem with this is that until we bring the sensor back up, we're not watching the traffic. And so we find it interesting that most organizations are prioritizing availability over security because they want our sensors to fail open. The second input is the intrusion detection system or, or IDS. And while the intrusion detection system is not a preventive control, it still is addressing about 70% of the negative behavior that we can predict on a network. IDS is not automated. It requires human beings to monitor alerts that tell us which negative behavior might be on the network. And thus IDS alerts are about 99.999% false positives because we want to make sure we're looking at everything that might be a problem. And it might seem crazy monitoring alerts when you know that 99.999% of them are false positives, but we still want to see that 0.001% that is not a false positive because that can cause real damage. In other words, from a value perspective, we're not really looking for a needle in a haystack. We're looking for a diamond in the rough. An IDS is usually configured with the sensor plugged into the span port on your switch so that with IDS, we're passively monitoring traffic. And if a sensor fails, while well, we're not monitoring the traffic, just like with IPS, but we're also not causing an availability issue with the client's network. A wealth of contextual information exists in your event logs from any device on your network. And so currently, the third primary input into a seam are the event logs coming from critical devices. And, and this is because of economical as well as, again, speed issues. But know that we can take logs from everything from servers to firewalls to applications to internet of things things <laughs> um, and we would like to get logs from everywhere we feel we're eventually going to get logs from everywhere and and you know really it might not be logs i mean there's you know we work in the banking industry and so bankers all have what they call a core processor core processors don't want to share their logs and so we screen scrape reports from their fraud management systems, from their uh, you 
know, their event management systems, that sort of thing. But we can get reports from anti-malware systems, from UTM devices, from your anti-spyware, -spy from, from your endpoint security systems, from your ticketing systems, from any you know, system that's producing information that you would consider to be intelligence. And, you know, it's not that hard to screen scrape PDFs, just so you know. So the final primary input is what we call change detection. Banks are required to do this by uh, 2015 regulation. But know that long before 2015, we started providing this service to our clients. Uh, we've been doing it since about 2007 when we had a utility company want us to monitor uh, their circuits. It wasn't even ports on a firewall. But we've also had clients have us monitor their customer lists because they wanted to know if it had been copied or moved or whatever. Um, and we can, you know, use change detection to do web face, uh, web face website defacement monitoring um, as an example of what change detection does. But primarily what most of our clients are having us do and what we've been recommending since 2007 is that we scan the non-UDP ports on externally facing firewalls so that we can notice any time a port changes status and report on that so that if your internal tech team is opening ports for vendors or whatever temporary reason, we make sure those ports get closed when they don't need to be open anymore. Through all of these four inputs, then, the managed security service provider looks for a response to and notifies the internal technical team about all the diamonds that we have found in the rough, the, you know, the, the, the action items, so to speak, the needles that are in the haystack. But the scene will require that the tech team, you know, responds to these various needles in the haystack, and they include account lockouts, uh, successful logins after hours, logins to backdoor administrator accounts, escalation of permissions, uh, backup failures, hard drive failures, hard drive capacity issues, server reboots, um, anomaly service requests, I should say anomaly service requests, <laughs> malware events. I mean, there's just a, a myriad of diamonds that we can find in that rough. And they can be correlated back, you know, to IPS and IDS in real time, by the way. And, and you know, the bottom line is, is that usually we don't really have emergencies to respond to. And that's why the daily report becomes so important. But part of the daily reporting process needs to be acknowledgement by that internal technical team. And so maybe our three teams drawing needs to be modified because what happens in practice is that the MSSP is finding the issues right and the internal tech team is responding to the issues. And then on a monthly or quarterly basis, however often your incident response team is going to meet, that's really when the oversight process comes into play and we're making sure that, that the issues are being closed um, in the ticketing system and then you know confirmed in the seam. So, you know, what we really have here is a situation where the seam is a filtering operation, right? And so, you know, it's filtering false positives down to actionable events. And of the million, you know, alerts and 20,000 logs that generate actionable events, and, that, you know, that's what that previous slide was saying, is that you know, it takes a million alerts to generate an actionable event on average. Um, and 20,000 logs to generate an actionable event. And so we then sort them into what requires immediate real-time response versus what we need to know about at the end of the day. For example, if somebody is granted administrator privileges at 3 in the morning, you might want to be called. But if this happens at 3 in the afternoon, you might just want an email. And likewise, if a disk, you know, a hard drive meets you know, 80% of capacity at 3 in the morning, you want us to wait until, you know, normal business hours to inform you of that. 
And so the decision tree and the calling tree and the log analysis definitions are really the documents that establish not only what we're going to do with what we see, but then also when we're going to do that with it. And then, of course, the calling tree comes into play in terms of, you know, who gets what type of an alert. And big data allows for all kinds of trends analysis, and it's really great in terms of helping the uh, oversight function, you know, that the incident response team plays. But it's also used for real-time threat hunting, um, as well as network troubleshooting, by the way. They're one of the greatest unintended consequences of moving all this data into a database and then applying big data tactics towards it is that we are given a wealth of information that we can leverage when we're trying to troubleshoot problems on the network. And we often, you know, find that network engineers are, are uncovering misconfiguration issues that have been confounding them for years uh, during our tuning process. And I want to be careful how I say that because I don't want you to get the impression that putting a seam in is going to all of a sudden uncover all kinds of issues. But if there were some issues there that, you know, we've been working around because we can't figure out why they exist, they very often materialize during the tuning process. But whoever manages your seam for you will need to work out a decision tree in order to avoid waking you up at night and, and you know, making yet at the same time giving you the confidence that if you do need to be woken up, uh, we're making that call. And when you engage with an MSSP, they will be teaching your incident response team how to review and understand the trend reports and really, you know, how to use those reports to not only provide that oversight function, but also to notice uh, trends that perhaps the IT team doesn't notice because they're too close to the trees to see the forest. And there's many different approaches to threat hunting, and it could be just as simple as a you know, non-technical person on the you know, uh, incident response team saying, hey, why is this different? And the IT people are like, holy cow, I didn't realize that. I didn't see that. Um, but there's thousands and thousands of known vulnerabilities for which we can write signatures. And we can apply the notion of once bitten, twice shy to known threats with signature-based monitoring, right? But the best way to manage the unknown vulnerabilities and threats is to determine what behaviors would be noticeable if a threat was exploiting a vulnerability under the radar. And so it's kind of like that whole, you know, drip, drip, drip approach towards attacking your network. Um, the seam needs to be able to see and assemble minor steps in that cybersecurity kill chain. We can recognize when threats are attacking us over time. We can see the behaviors in event logs and network traffic, especially when we're correlating the two. And when we see these behaviors, and a lot of times it's based on the requests that are being asked of our operating systems, right? But as human beings, we can interpret, you know, what we see as behaviors a lot better than any, any human being is going to be able to predict in some kind of an automated response tool. So, because of this, you know, we've been dwelling all this time on the fact that the SEAM is a database, but let's pull back from that a bit to the notion that a SEAM is not just a database, that it's a place. And like any place, it has an architecture. And when you look at the architecture of the SEAM, we have those four inputs. Now, I'll have to say I combined IPS and IDS mainly out of convenience for the sake of my drawing here. Um, but these are the four inputs that a typical SIEM architecture includes. But we need to recognize that there's also an interface into that SIEM, what we call the visualization interface. And the incident response team needs to be able to interact with trend and event information that the SIEM highlights for us. But also, the data security analysts need to be able to drill down and have all kinds of querying capabilities, you know, into those 
the, into the database that's holding those four inputs. And your network support team is going to want to be able to go to into that visualization interface as well in order to troubleshoot or perform analysis or investigation or, you know, respond to the event tickets that are coming out of the scene. For an example, if there's a misconfiguration error on a user's endpoint, the network support team would want to be able to review the event logs for that endpoint in order to find a problem. And then we have, you know, reports, you know, that the non-technical universe in our school corporation needs to be able to understand um, and, you know, we've already talked about that with normalization and thresholding and that sort of thing. Now, as another an example of how economies are affecting the seam design, you know, currently your seam provider is not going to, you know, be managing your UTM for you. It doesn't make sense. Not, internal tech teams already know how to manage malware. You've already engaged in, you know, a myriad of contracts to, you know, address the issue of malware prevention and, Boy, it isn't broke. Why fix it? But we want to be able to get the information from these systems into our seam, if for no other reason, to make sure that, you know, what the malware system says is true. And so maybe what we do is we, you know, integrate the vulnerability management processes that will let us know that, hey, the dats weren't updated on this particular endpoint, or the patches, of course, is what most people think about when they think about vulnerability management. But, you know, here's where, you know, screen scraping the uh, you know exception report or the heat map or whatever that's coming out of your vulnerability management systems because it's not just one right um, is going to be able to deliver more actionable information we're going to be able to find more diamonds in the rough if we include these systems into the seam and right now it's you know it's it's really not um, a primary input the reports aren't directly going in um, and likewise, with any data loss prevention or endpoint security systems, we, we would love to get the logs directly from these systems, but it might be a matter of, hey, let's just screen scrape the reports that, that you're already reviewing so that we can have that information in our repository or in our wiki. And then finally, one of the more important functions of a seam in order to ensure proper mitigation is that alert information, you know, those needles in the haystack need to be addressed on a day-to-day -day basis, on a real-time basis. Um, and so in order to do that, we want to make sure that the seam integrates with your ticketing system or whatever project management system you're using so that it's easier for you to be able to respond properly um, as, you know, those diamonds in the rough are discovered by the main security service provider or the security operations center. And this leaves us really with the true SIEM architecture that we see in most organizations today. And as you can see, because of all the moving parts, we can't look at the SIEM as being an application. It's, it's a collection of applications at best that's being used by the three teams and by the way it's being watched 24 by 7 by 365 and one of the primary advantages of having a seam is that notion that the security team is watching that on the weekends they're watching it on the holidays they're watching it you know on the 366th day of the year in 2020 right which is leap year the SEAM team is always watching is what we'd like our clients to be able to say to their board of directors. And not only are we always watching, but we're also always collecting forensics data in the background. There's always a documentation of the context of what's going on. And then finally, not only are they watching for active threats, exploiting vulnerabilities, but they're also hunting for threats you know, we're looking at that little pieces of data that added together over time mean more than just what they say individually. And the internal tech team as well as the incident response team definitely appreciates the fact that we have their back. Now, we've watched larger organizations decide that they can take an approach where they only staff the SOC during the day or even worse, the flip side of it. And there's definitely a false sense of security in the notion 
that attacks are going to occur at our convenience. Really, in terms of convenience, the attacks occur when the North Koreans are awake, not us. But even this is naive, for the North Koreans aren't, you know, they, they've wisened up to the notion that in order for their attacks to work, they need to attack users that are actually using their systems. And so they're staying awake very late in their night so that they can social engineer us during the day or during our day. And if they're designed well, these attacks are going to come in under the radar. They're, they're not going to be an attack that we can predict in a signature or in a DAT file in our antivirus system. And because of that, we need to make sure that gray matter is involved in the monitoring of our scene. You know, what I really love about the first grant for the school corporations is that it actually used the term, human beings must watch your network. And, and that is really the cusp of the advantage of having a true managed security service provider is that they're watching your network 24 by 7 and they're not relying on automated tools solely. Now, you know, a lot of what we're doing is becoming more and more automated, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to be able to look for, predict, and thwart the behavior of an attack. And that's it's with as much artificial intelligence as we have these days, that's something that still requires gray matter. As a matter of fact, what I like to say is the threats might be digital, but it takes a human being to fully respond to those digital threats. So with that, why don't we uh, see what our scene looks like in action. Thanks, Dan. As Dan said, we want to take you through a seam in action. But first, a quick disclaimer. We will be showing you our scene because we obviously have more access and more expertise with it. Okay, disclaimer finished. Now let's jump in. So, seam in action. The first scenario we have is what we like to call gray matter. In this example, a human being, one of our DSAs watching the SOC, has noticed that there's is a potential phishing malicious payload or possible ransomware activity and the alert looks actionable. Here's an example of the alert. We can see from our custom written signature that it is showing a reverse lookup pointing to a bad actor as part of the signature looking for blacklisted bad IPs as well as pattern matching payloads. So what do we do? We dig a bit deeper. We check the payload we look at web filter logs, DNS logs, we run a machine lookup and see what the actual machine name was because the IP address can change. So we want to make sure that we are watching the correct IP or watching the machine name if it's getting different IPs and then review any account login activity. As I said before, our analysts found actionable data, so let's take a look. Here's a shot of the actionable payload. So this is part of our signature that's looking for a malicious payload, and we have something here. Our analyst follows the decision tree, calls the client, and sends a ticket. Here's an example of our decision tree. And in this case, it actually fits three different categories because they're all kind of the same. We have spyware, malware, virus, trojan, and ransomware. Now all three, we are basically recommending the same thing. We want you to alert your staff of it. We want to take the system offline and we want to isolate and scan that system, run our checks and make sure that system is clean before, before we re reintroduce it to the environment. We also recommend putting a watch on traffic or log for that device so that we know quicker if something is to happen again, we are keeping a closer eye on it. We recommend that they review this with their incident response team and as always, we offer to sit in. And to close this one, as always, we document and follow the incident response process. The next example we have is client initiated. Now in this scenario, a client has two users report a browser pop-up claiming their windows is infected. I'm sure we've all seen it. It might look a little something like this. So the client is notified by the antivirus that they have a possible infection. In this case, a JavaScript file was actually quarantined from the internet cache. And obviously we have a worried client at this point. We recommend remediation on their end and we start the investigation on our end. We investigate using information provided by the client. We have the workstation IPs, the antivirus findings, and maybe the most important piece, the time frame that it happened. 
even if it is a broad time frame. Obviously, the more precise, the better. Here's an example of some of the actionable information we were able to find in our scene. We found some compelling evidence in the fire, firewall web filter logs that we can see in the seam here. Again, we are bringing in logs from different devices, bringing in information from different devices, and we are correlating these together. So here we are seeing that we have some blocking events that were generated by the web filter that was attempting to connect to a known ad server and triggered a notice. So we are chasing this down the rabbit hole. So what do we do next? We weren't able to follow that rabbit hole any further, so we try to recreate it in a sandbox environment. We load up a sandbox, we load the page hundreds if not thousands of times, trying to replicate the reported behavior. And of course, we are going to use a sandbox environment so we don't accidentally infect something else on our network. In this case, we couldn't recreate it by visiting the website in the sandbox. So we did conclude it was most likely a bad third-party JavaScript ad or the ad server got compromised, something like that, and that they probably resolved the problem, maybe even several levels removed from the affected website owner, whoever, whomever is serving ads on the website. Again, this is a website that they used to do their work, so it was a concern for them. So we notified the client of our findings. In the last case we offered, in this case they actually took, asked and took us up on our offer to sit in with the IR team and tech team, also the owner of the affected website, because they have been told not to use this website, so they want to make sure the problem is resolved and everyone is informed. The website owner asked for some information from the seam, basically a report showing what we found so that they can follow up and do their due diligence. Of course, we cleared that with our client. We don't provide anything without our client's approval. We get that to the website owner and again, we document and follow the incident response process. All right, our third and last example here is of an automated notification. So the way the system works is that we are sending out this real-time alert to not only our 24 by 7 SOC, but also our clients, relevant team members that we set up during the deployment and tuning process. So in this case, our analysts and the client are notified by a real-time alert that there is an unusually high number of lockouts and failures on a high-value account on a high-value server. So obviously, we contact the client. And also, it just so happens that the client was also dealing with this lockout problem and it was impacting their business and locking them out of different critical systems and services, just becoming a pain in the neck. So they were actually in the process of deciding their next steps and calling us was next on that list. So we reached out right in time in this scenario. We investigate and find a service tied to the admin account as failing login due to a bad password. We identify that account and it is for an application and we note the machine and services that is failing on. Here's an example of that in our scene. Again, bringing in that login data to be able to correlate that and also being able to pivot based on IP or the type of data it is or even relevant events, being able to pivot and see where else it might have shown up is also helpful in many scenarios like this. We can see here a failure reason, bad password, username admin, this was login type three, it's a network login. So we notify the client, the client informs us that they recently changed the password for that user account in question. They said it was actually the named administrator account and then they forgot to change it for several other affected applications and services that are tied to it. Client updates the password on that service and thanks us. Yay, happy client. Now we do recommend segregating admin accounts to reduce the risk of this happening again. In this case, they were using the named admin account. They were sharing it. We recommend the best practices to have individual admin accounts. That way you have the ability to track that activity to that user and then actually turn that standard named default admin account into essentially a dummy account that doesn't do anything but can be a precursor if we see attempts to access it or use that account. That adds accountability and reduces that risk. And again, we document and we follow the incident response process. So Dan, I hope that was informative and helpful. And back to you. So, okay. Now that we know why we need a SIEM, now that we know what a SIEM is, 
and now that we have seen a seam in action, let's talk about how all this applies to school corporations. And so when Infotex first learned about the grants made available by the Indiana Department of Education, we circled back in our own internal risk assessments around to the notion of does our seam fully cooperate with the laws and regulations that school corporations need to cooperate with? And, you know, like I said, we've been working with school corporations since 2003, but they never really mentioned compliance to us, and so we just wanted to make sure that we had our ducks in a row from that perspective. And so we went to school, and and we cast our net, um, and we didn't really find any clear guidance for school corporations like we've grown used to in the banking industry. You know, in the banking industry, not only do they publish very clear guidance about all aspects of information security, they actually have bank examiners come out and audit banks to make sure that they understand that guidance. And we're, ne- we're, we're seeing nothing like that in education. And so we put on our legal risk auditor hats and really kind of came at this from the perspective of what would lawyers bring to litigation if they were to sue a school corporation for a cybersecurity failure. And so in that regard, you know, we already knew that school corporations had compliance pressure from FERPA. And when we analyzed FERPA, we noticed that it actually is pointing to HIPAA and Graham Leach Bliley. Now with most organizations, you know, like banks for an example, we, we tell our bank clients you don't really have to worry about EPHI, you know, the, the data that we're trying to protect from, you know, attack that's health information. And the reason banks don't need to worry about that is because there's a very small volume of health information when you compare it to the amount of PII, personally identifiable information, that banks are collecting. But the long and short of it is, is that volume isn't going to get schools out of any of this compliance pressure because you have a large volume of health information. You have a large volume of PII, and of course you have a large volume of student information. I mean, it's a third, a third, a third. And so the question is, is, you know, what would a lawyer put in front of a jury if there was a cybersecurity failure, and, and we're already covered, we're already good to go when it comes to EPHI and PII, so we decided to focus in on FERPA and student information, and, and what we found was an incident response checklist, and it really made our job a lot easier, and by the way, it's the PTAC document, and I'll have to admit, I didn't know what the Privacy Technical Assistance Center was until we started doing this research, But I do know that that will help you, but if you don't want to have to go out and dig up the document on your own, you know, we've we've got a link to it just to make it easier for us to find it. Um, But, you know, suffice it to say, Sophia's probably already provided, you know, several documents to you today. Um, But what we're really talking about here is the FERPA data breach response checklist. Hello, moviegoers. Please pardon the interruption. But we wanted to let you know that since this is obviously the movie and not the live webinar, you don't have the documents that we made available in the webinar. So if you'd like any of the documents mentioned, just know that you can email us at info at infotext.com. Please also note that we have some links that provide some more information. Schools.infotext.com, which is essentially the school related articles of our long running security blog education.infotext.com, which is a resource for movies like this one, as well as our webinar schedule. And last but not least, FERPAResponse.infotext.com that was referred to during the webinar. Now back to the movie. And so you'll understand why the policy boilerplate can come in handy uh, when we start diving into what you need to do to make sure you're fully in compliance with the FERPA requirements related to incident response and it starts with the policy and we believe that separate from your existing security policy you need to have a standalone incident response policy that the school board approves. This policy will posit to the school board that there is no such thing as 100% security 
And then the school board will say, well, therefore, when a breach occurs, management shall ensure a trained team responds to the breach in a manner compliant with applicable laws and in a manner that protects our parents and our students. And the policy may, you know, establish team membership and and even a meeting schedule for the team. Uh, But the policy will also call for the creation of an incident response plan that then refers out to tools, which could be procedures, it could be, you know, the SEAM, it could be IPS, IDS, it could be your anti-malware system, etc. We we lump all that under the term tools. Now, we try to encourage our clients to reduce the policy to be as close to one page as possible, and it really should be what the school board is telling you, the so-called security management team of the school, to do because of the fact that there's no such thing as 100% security. It's, it's not a matter of if anymore. It's a matter of when. And thus, the school board wants your team to be prepared to implement a plan for responding to cybersecurity incidents. And so this FERPA checklist is actually the basis of your incident response plan, which, you know, will then call for, you know, procedures and tools and that sort of thing. Um, It's what the SEAM provides are the tools. The, The SEAM should be providing for IPS, IDS, event log management change detection, and it should also be providing incident response logs and that whole wiki I was referring to earlier. Why don't we just go ahead and take a quick look um, at the FERPA checklist. Now, you know, I apologize for a little bit of weirdness in what you're looking at here, uh, but it's a typical guidance. Um, it's, you know, available on student privacy, you know, dot ed dot gov. Um, it starts off with your typical guidance language that includes the purpose and that sort of thing. Um, dives into the definition of a data breach, which is very similar to what we see in banking guidance. And then it starts, you know, articulating what I just kind of went over with. You know, they, you know, they say there should be a policy, a plan, a procedure. Uh, we, we, you know, we consider the procedure to be part of that toolkit I was talking about. And then there is a checklist for actually what needs to happen in that plan itself. And so I don't know if you noticed, but 90% preparation, right, before the breach is a good chunk of the checklist. And then there's, you know, a a lot of stuff that needs to happen when we actually respond to the breach. Now, you know, your seam will will cue all this type of stuff up in a wizard-driven format based on the type of information that's at, you know, risk, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, But suffice it to say that this is what our compliance posture is now based on when it comes to our making sure that our seam is compliant for school corporations. Let's go ahead and get out of that and go back to the uh, PowerPoint for our webinar. Because what I'd like to do now is just walk through a few of these checklist items, starting with the notion that we should continually monitor for PII. You see how FERPA's pointing towards Graham Leach Bliley? And you know, I love that the guidance, you know, specifically calls for the tools that we're in the business to sell. And, you know, it's obvious that a seems going to help you with this particular checklist item. Validating the data breach. One of the prime benefits of a well-defined seam is the ability to parse and normalize data, right? So that we can focus our response where the risk is and, you know, Again, we're clearing through millions of alerts to find a diamond in the rough, which is exactly what this checklist is calling for here. The event log management system of a SIEM continually and constantly collects and archives forensic evidence, which is the gist of what this checklist item is wanting us to be prepared for. And one of the most important checks that we perform twice per eight hour shift, by the way, is a check of the health report because that is so important to make sure that we continue to get the contextual information that you need when you're collecting forensics evidence. I'm not going to expect you to read everything before I get off this slide in this webinar, but know that what's nice about engaging with a third-party managed security service provider is that you're bringing all of their expertise onto your team. 
not only do they assist in incidents and you know warn you of you know a threat you know explaining a vulnerability but you're going to find their expertise when they participate in your incident response team meetings when when they show you how to review the trend reports when when they help your non-technical team members understand their role in information security are going to be almost as beneficial and almost as much of an unintended consequence of your engaging with them as the troubleshooting advantages of having a seam uh, will be evident to you shortly after you start the deployment of the seam. A seam is also an information repository in our opinion, right? It's the I in the acronym seam. And thus there's a host of templates and boilerplates, etc., available to assist with the actual workflow of a response. The way an incident is documented is essential when it comes to legal and compliance risk mitigation. And unfortunately, we're being asked to document when our panic level is high, right? And so a seam should walk us through the appropriate documentation using wizards to ensure that we've got all our ducks in a row, that we're dotting our I's and that we're crossing our T's. Now the checklist, like, like most guidance documents, is out of date. I don't know if you noticed when I brought up and showed you, but it's circa 2012. And that's normal, by the way, in IT guidance. Um, the regulars just can't keep up because technology is changing. You know, very often guidance is, even though it's trying to be written to be technology neutral, it's usually out of date the day it's published. So there's a couple things that, even though are not addressing that FERPA checklist, you should know that employing a SEAM, hiring an MSSP helps you cover, starting with the notion that we had already alluded to earlier, and that is that the deployment process should properly lay the paper trail for what we're not going to watch. We want future litigators to back away from blame on oversights and to recognize that when we didn't watch something, it was a risk-based decision that led to our not watching it. It wasn't an oversight. And likewise, we want to make sure that we're properly archiving our logs and that we're keeping them for an appropriate amount of time. Guidance, we've, we've never seen it. We don't see it in the banking guidance. We don't see it in the HIPAA guidance. There's no guidance that details how long our logs should be archived. And so what we're encouraging our clients to do is to keep them forever. Uh, unless you're a crook, why would you not want to have the proof of what was true on a particular date. And that's really what archiving the logs is. If you're archiving them in forensics proof fashion, you have proof as to what happened during any particular event at any particular time. So we encourage our clients to keep logs indefinitely and we'll show them how to do that. Now let's go over the primary steps in developing a good FERPA compliant incident response program, okay? That, that checklist really should be the basis of your plan. We've got a really good boilerplate. I don't know if you're already opening and looking at it, but you know the policy itself puts you in a good position to be able to bridge the communication gap between the board and the people who are actually going to respond to an incident, but it also puts you in a good position legally. And then once you, you know, have a good policy and plan in place, of course, you're not going to be enforcing your policy until you have a whole bunch of tools put together or maybe you've engaged with a managed security service department or a managed security service provider, I should say, to deploy a SIEM for you. And, and what I was kind of heading towards saying is, and unless you have a whole, your own security department that can handle that on its own, and most school corporations simply aren't large enough to be able to afford that. And then... The great thing about outsourcing to an MSSP is that other than showing up to your monthly incident response team meetings and participating in the tabletop tests, you're done with one final exception, and that is that you need to make sure that you're implementing good vendor management practices because you're transferring a lot of risk that MSSP. And I don't know if you remember, but earlier in our you know presentation here, we talked about the quality controls that make an MSSP a true MSSP. And I want to just kind of drill down on that a little bit. Because you're a school and you have to comply with three different laws, 
The compliance aspects of engaging with an MSSP are very important. And so from a due diligence perspective, your managed security service provider has what we call a, a persistent connection to your network. And so in the banking world, what that means is that they're a critical vendor. They, you know, they don't possess PII, but if someone was to hack the MSSP, they could leverage the persistent access to get their hands on PII and cause a lot of damage. And so because of that, MSSPs in the banking world are considered to be at the top tier in terms of what they need to be able to produce. And so the first thing is, is that Infotex and the MSSP, you know, providers that, that you will engage with that are already working with banks are in a federal program called the FFIEC Examination Program. And what this program does is that, A, it, you, you have to have a whole bunch of third-party audits done that the FFI examiners, these are just bank examiners from all the different agencies, um, and they actually come into our office for a couple weeks, you know, an examination. Um, we have our audits done annually, and then they come in and they review the audits, they review our financial statements, they review our insurance. Really, they review all of these quality controls, and they make sure that they're at a level that a critical vendor to banks need to be at. And so this is something that you're going to need to get your hands around in order to properly monitor the risk that you're transferring when you engage with a managed security service provider. And, you know, quite frankly, it's a lot easier said than done. But if you're working with an MSSP that has their act together, one of the first reports they should be providing to you doesn't even come from their SIEM application. It's what we call the due diligence packet. And it will have the results of their audits. It'll have references in it. It'll have affidavits um, for controls that are hard to audit. Um, it'll have everything you need to make sure that they are hitting all of these quality controls. But beyond the due diligence packet, you know, what reporting should we expect from SEAMS? To me, the cusp of any good compliance program is the paper trail that it leaves, the documentation that not only auditors can view to make sure that you are in compliance, but also is the documentation that litigators would look at if they wanted to try to sue you for not being in compliance. So it needs to be good. And that brings us back around to, you know, the reason why you have a SEAM in the first place and the reason why smart auditors and examiners are looking for health information when it comes to your SEAM. And so let me start right off by saying that as an auditor, I've already said this a couple times, but the most important report you're going to get from your system is the report that proves the system is working as intended and that all the devices and all the inputs that are supposed to report into the seam are actually reporting into the seam. Beyond that, reporting is where the rubber really meets the road in terms of the incident response team. You know, it, you know again, I alluded to, you know, it'd be nice if the incident response team's commitment is that monthly meeting and then the availability to assemble in an emergency team meeting if we do have that incident, or I should say when we do have that incident. And then again, the tabletop testing. But the analysis of past events can help us predict future events. And so the incident response team really needs to fully understand how to review those trend reports. Now, there's a lot of other reporting, you know, that gets done out of a seam. You know, there's a whole set of reports that just facilitate the tuning process. And then there's, of course, the reports that we run again and again and again, the queries that we're constantly running to help the internal tech team with their troubleshooting that we might as well can and make available to the tech team, right? So that they don't have to go through us to run those reports. But finally, there's the daily report. What we're hoping for in a daily report, of course, is confirmation that the scene provider, that your managed security service provider saw nothing, that the sky hasn't fallen yet. Our clients ultimately hire us because they want to sleep at night. 
And so we need to give them that report in the morning that says, hey, your good night's sleep was for good reasons. Nothing happened last night. And really, it kind of takes us back to the relationship between the MSSP and the internal tech team because the confirmation process is a two-way process. There's, there's mutual reliance in this process. Our clients need us to confirm that we're watching the network and we need our clients to confirm that they're receiving and acting on the reports. And then finally, of course, the incident response team needs to confirm that the entire process is working as designed. Now, one of the reports that we're really proud of currently is that you can put an asset on any asset, you know, you can put a watch, I should say, on any asset, user, or threat, or vulnerability. So, hopefully you don't look like this when you, uh, you know, get your watch report. And by the way, what Kevin Mitnick did, you know, wouldn't be found in the network traffic uh, because he did most of his hacking via pretext calling, which is something that would be monitored, by the way, by the non-technical people on the incident response team. But when we talk about that two-way confirmation, you know, we're really talking about mutual reliance. And so, this, you know, an important part of reporting, you know, beyond that a threat is exploiting a vulnerability or the health of the system is the action items that the internal tech team gets to close out in order to say that, yes, we are listening to what's coming off of the scene. And the fact is the confirmation process is what thwarts a threat exploiting a vulnerability. You know, we talk about the difference between IPS and IDS. Well, prevention of an incident occurring in the first place happens when somebody mitigates what we see in the health of the system. And thus, the incident response team is, you know, again, they're that oversight mechanism. The internal tech team often prioritizes by urgency rather than importance, and so it's nice to know that once a month, the incident response team is helping put urgency into some of the action items that are coming out of the scene. The network is not static. It's living and breathing, and so as it breathes, as it lives, it changes. And therefore, we need to constantly change our seam to respond to that change, or else it won't be a healthy seam. Kind of our mantra here is healthy seams require teams. And there's just a lot of questions that need to be answered on a regular basis. And by the way, these are the questions that the incident response team should be asking. Which brings me finally back to the title of this webinar, As Simple As It Seems. Um, as you probably know by now, it's not really as simple as it seems, but as you learn more about test technology, risk monitoring, and, and network monitoring, we hope you realize that the primary takeaway from this webinar should be that there's three teams who need to work together as one team. It's that simple. And if you're interested in seeing a live demo of our scene, by the way, please let Michael or Sophia know by, you know, raising your hand, or you can just email us if you want, and we'd be happy to arrange the demo. Hello again, moviegoers. Again, sorry for the interruptions. We just wanted to give you another chance to jot down this information or take a screenshot if you were interested in contacting us. And with that, I will turn control of the webinar over to Michael. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for your time. And again, thank you everybody for joining us today. When you view an Infotech's webinar or movie, you do so with four caveats. First, you're agreeing to the terms posted at the web page listed on this slide. Second, our lawyers want you to know that what Infotex presents is often time dated or about new trends, regulations, or guidance, and therefore we cannot provide this material with any warranty whatsoever. Thirdly, material provided with Infotex webinars and movies is copyrighted. You keep the copyright to material customized to your organization, but Infotex reserves the right to use the material in other engagements and boilerplates. See our transfer of copyright agreement at the webpage listed in this slide. Finally, those who view our webinars or movies may be added to an email mailing list. 
If you do not wish to receive notice of additional educational opportunities, please accept our apologies and please opt out at the web page shown on this slide.